This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. We've just heard a very interesting uh, morning and afternoon session, and I'm very much looking forward uh, to talking about the opportunities that exist to uh, generate these sustainable solutions and addressing these issues of food security here in California. And California's role in this discussion, I think, is very important. So just as our theme of this forum reads, California Roots Global Reach, it is imperative that we hold these kinds of conversations uh, focused on our responsibility, not only as a leading agricultural producing state, but also as a leading agricultural research entity. So California has been a leader and an innovator uh, in developing technologies and systems in agriculture. So it's only natural that we would be a leader in developing and finding solutions to some of those problems that we've heard about today. And so I would like to focus on those opportunities that we in California, across all our different perspectives here at this table, what we bring in terms of looking for opportunities for innovation and implementation. And so to moderate our panel this afternoon, uh, we have award-winning journalist and author, Mark Eriks. And Mark is written extensively on numerous California issues, especially in agriculture, and has several award-winning books that are in the book room, including West of the West, uh, which chronicles, uh, through storytelling, uh, the changes in California agriculture uh, over the last 30, 40 years, Mark's lifetime, the last 20 years oh, or yeah. so. Oh, and <laughs> so uh, you better stand up here so I can get a little uh, See closer. See my a little bit. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> So uh, Mark does dig deep into the dirt of the Golden State because his roots come from the Golden State and from Fresno County. And his stories are told uh, from the close-up of that native Californian perspective. And as a California native and award-winning journalist, it is your personal connection to the land that enables you to be the terrific moderator for our afternoon session. So please welcome Mark Eric. Thank you. Uh, I got to meet Barbara at the Tulare County Farm Show. Uh, we were kicking around tires, big tires. I mean, <laughs> giant tires. Uh, just a delightful person. She had her cowboy boots on that day. And uh, I think we ended the day eating some superior ice cream from Hanford, California. Um, I want to talk for a couple minutes on the outset, kind of teed up. We've got this wonderful panel. We'll probably do it in s some ways similar to the last panel, but a little different too. Um, I will try to get out of the way. I want the panel to raise their own questions, answer their own questions in some, some ways. If there's a pause, I'll obviously tee them up but we want to have a discussion, an argument, all sorts of things, uh, looking at our role in California, not only feeding the world, but feeding ourselves and the nation. Uh, I grew up in Fresno. All around me were farms. All around me were farm workers. Uh, but I saw none of it, really, as a kid growing up in the suburbs of Fresno. Uh, it was very possible to be kind of profoundly ignorant of your place, and I was. Um, went away to school, got a job in Baltimore and then LA and eventually made my way back to, to Fresno as the, uh, the bureau chief of the San Joaquin Valley for the Los Angeles Times. And I started looking into my place, trying to figure it out. I remember one, 
one day I was in my bureau, which was my bedroom. Um, <laughs> the, the Times had a lot of money then, but they didn't want to open an office in Fresno. And I got a call, and this, I can't remember who it was, but he said, Tulare Lake has come back to life. I said, Tulare Lake? He said, it's back to life. It was a 1998. It was a huge uh, snow year that year, and a big, big Pineapple Express came in and melted the snow. And this valley that often would, was a desert had turned into a marsh. So I said, well, let me take a look at Tulare Lake. So I pulled out the map. And on one of the maps, the lake was square. On another map, it was blue. On another map, it wasn't blue. So I drove out, uh, paved road to dirt road. Dirt road ended at the base of this dike. And this dike was something right out of Holland, giant. Two trucks could pass on the top of it. And I got up, and there were white, the wind was whipping white caps past these telephone poles. And if you look close enough at the telephone poles, you could see the marks of the past floods. Tulare Lake had come back to life, but it was a mere ghost uh, in its heyday, before the dams, before the canals, before the corralling of all that, the, the straight jacketing of those rivers. Uh, Tulare Lake was 800 square miles. It was the most dominant feature on the California map. This was before these families from the plantation south, chased out by the boll weevil, came to California. And the two most prominent families were the Boswells and the Salyers. And that day, and for the next month that followed, they were fighting this epic battle, trying to keep this water off their land. And they had erected these giant pumps along three rivers. And they were shunting the water to these containment areas. And if you looked close enough, they literally had stopped the rivers and made them run backward. And so driving back that day, I thought, geez, we, we have gone a tremendous length to defy nature. Um, and the farmer, the California farmer, cannot be denied. Um, when I got a chance to talk to Mr. Boswell, he conceded a lot about that kind of farming. He thought that one day if his, if his grandchild ever took over, the grandchild would wonder what the hell he was doing with all that water, all that land, all that machine, growing a surplus crop, a subsidized crop, like cotton. So my, my grandson's gonna think we were crazy. Well, we don't just grow cotton. From the Imperial Valley, to the Coachella Valley, to the San Joaquin Valley, to the Salinas Valley, Valley to the Sacramento Valley, we have some six and a half million acres of farmlands that still exist. We raise more than 250 crops. We grow more tomatoes, salad greens, almonds, pistachios, grapes, peaches, plums, nectarines, pomegranates, cutie mandarins, carrots. We pull more milk from more cows than any other single place in the world. Now, I don't think anybody would call California a bread basket, but it's certainly a fruit, nut, and vegetable bowl, creamery rolled into one. We produce more milk and more meth than any place. <laughs> Can it be sustained? Will it be sustained to feed us? What's food security in America? And to feed a growing world? When I was listening to Wes at lunch, he was talking about grains. Well, in the 1880s, we grew more wheat in California than any other place. There's a little town called Traver along Highway 99. It's now withered from salt. But Traver, in one year, shipped out more wheat than any spot in the world. So do we return to that kind of agriculture to feed the world? How do we make these decisions? Uh, we have always been on the leading edge of innovation. I mean, let's face it, the organic movement started here. The farm worker movement started here in Delano. Um, the development of some of the first uh, crops that were bioengineered, the flavors, was it this flavor saver tomato? Yeah. 
So we're going to lead the way. We have to. And our universities and the research there will lead the way as they have led the way. And so this is the kind of conversation I'd like to have today. And um, I think that's a good segue into introducing our panel. Okay. On the far side is Bill Fulton. He's our politician. <laughs> Former mayor of Ventura. In Ventura, during Bill's time, Bill was very much a part of this. They started one of the, the a farmland preservation movement called SOAR, which was to preserve the farm. And uh, he's now taking that whole idea, uh, uh, basically drawing a ring around cities, letting certain growth come into the middle, but save that land from sprawl. And he's now taking that idea and taking it nationwide. Uh, he made me taking it worldwide. When I tried to reach him, he was in Israel. So maybe he was taking anti-sprawl movement to Israel. I don't know. But we're going to hear from Bill today. Bill? And then we have our first farmer, Grant Chafin. He grows alfalfa, cotton wheat, GMO crops. Sudan grass as well, along the California-Arizona border. He drinks right from the Colorado River. David Schwartz, one of our youngins, <laughs> founded his own movement, the Real Food Challenge. Essentially, he asked himself a question. What do universities do with an aggregate of a billion dollars in buying power? Where do they grocery shop? And the answer uh, disturbed him enough to, you know, to co-found this movement. And universities are now you know, asking themselves that question. And, and the question is, do you buy from in and around the university? Do you support the kind of agriculture that you teach in the classroom? So we're going to look forward to hearing from David. Komal Am Ahmed, another youngin. Graduated from UC Berkeley in 212. Uh, she's already been the founder or co-founder of three movements, Bear Abundance, Food Recovery Network, Feeding Forward. And the question that got her to act was, at UC Berkeley, we go to these uh, events, and all this food is left over after the events, and we have all this hunger in Oakland. What, how can we match these two things up? And she's done it with um, technology and just really exciting stuff. So we're going to hear from her, too. Alan McCune, a UC Riverside scientist working in genetic engineering. He authored a book called Pandora's Picnic Basket, Molecular gen Genesis, gen Geneticist. And I think that book was about the, the potentials and the hazards of GMOs. Next is Larry Smarr, founding director of the California Institute for Telecommunications and Information Technology out of UC San Diego and UC Irvine. And I mean, Larry, I talked to him last night. He could talk about anything and everything with expertise. Just one of those kinds of people. And I think he's going to be all over the place. But in particular, <laughs> I think his wheelhouse is can technology save agriculture from salts, from water shortages, and things like that to help feed the world. Linda Katehi, she is the chancellor at UC Davis, uh, the Aggies, OK? And she's a scientist and an engineer in her own right with numerous patents. And I think she will speak very eloquently to the role of the land-grant university to support ag in its mission and to and the question before us, feeding the nation and the world in the research arm of the UCs. Paul Muller is our second farmer. Full belly farms. I think it's, we don't want to talk about acres. We don't talk about acres, farmers don't like, you know. But he's got a nice amount of land <laughs> growing 70 to 80 crops. 90% of them sold within a 120-mile radius of where he farms, which is west of Sacramento. 
Then we have Stuart Wolf, uh, also a farmer from the west side of Fresno. He has a nice, nice amount of acres. <laughs> and we're going to try to get Stuart and Paul to talk to each other a little bit about their different ways of farming, uh, the similarities and some of the differences, and which model is more exportable. Because, yes, we've got a vast amount of land in California, but no matter how we farm it, and if we go back to some of those perennial biodiverse crops that were, spoke, were spoken about at lunch, it's not going to be enough to feed the world. So we're going to have to export our ideas to the world to feed them. Glenda Humiston, she is the state director of the USDA's Rural Development. And she's going to help us answer that question that I posed in that memo, which is how can it be that the top three farm producing counties in the country, when you rank the most impoverished counties in America, they are all up there, one, two, and eight, or something like that. Does farming, the way we do farming, does it have to have that kind of poverty? Um, are there models in the world where it's not that way? And let's, let's acknowledge that any kind of industrial form of anything has a tremendous amount of poverty associated with it. It's not just farming. Ted Batkin is also a San Joaquin Valley farmer. He's the president of California Citrus Research Board. He's working with UC da uh, R Riverside to combat these potentially devastating diseases to citrus. Um, we, as we all know, this was, Southern California was the citrus belt way back when. And like the dairy cows, they came up and over the mountain to the San Joaquin Valley. He will talk about just, um, you know, that challenge of, of trying to grow seedless clementines and keep the bees out of the fields. Okay. Finally, Joe Trainer. This guy knows more about bees than anybody in this room. He's written three books. One is called Bees Pollinating Almonds, and there are a lot of almonds, 800,000 acres of them in the San Joaquin Valley. Um, actually in California, but that's mostly in the valley. He'll talk about that monoculture and the colony collapse disorder, what, what might be behind that. We're hearing some things now that it might have to do with this nicotine-based pesticide. So we're going to have a lively discussion. I'm going to try to get out of the way. Hopefully what you just heard will be the most from me. Ask some questions, move it around. I want to start with our farmers. Okay. I was talking to Stuart Wolf the other day. Stuart lives in Fresno. His farmland is on the west side. It's probably a 45-minute drive. You know, the idea that he lives on his farm, you know, it's, it's kind of a Midwestern notion, we'll say. Um, but he was describing to me how in the past 20 years, how radically different that drive is. So Stuart, talk about that drive. Talk about why that drive has changed, what are the forces behind it, and I think that'll get us all started. Go ahead. Well, <clears throat> first, Mark, you, you do know my wife. I, I uh, actually grew up in a little town called Huron out on the west side, and I met my wife, Lisa, at Berkeley. And, uh, you know, we fell in love and all this kind of stuff, but <laughs> I had to swear to her that we would never live on the farm. In fact, I had to swear to her we would never live in Fresno. <laughs> so, uh, my, my father told me, if, if you really love her, just lie to her this one time. <laughs> so, anyway, I'm in Fresno. But the, uh, <laughs> we're, uh, the, the drive going out to the west side, going to the ranch, when, when, I, when I was a little guy in Huron, that whole area was, and they had, you gotta go back in time, uh, I was born in 59, so if you, in the early 60s, uh, there weren't as many people in, in California, and we had these great water projects. So we had plentiful water, it was reliable, and we had fan these fantastic soils on the west side. Often they're described as these salt-laden, you know, creating salinity issues, but 
there is a lot of fantastic ground out on the west side. And most of that ground when I was growing up was all in cotton, grain, uh, cantaloupes and, and stuff, all kind of low value uh, crops that were uh, supported with government subsidies and all this kind of stuff. And today, when I go out there with less water, what's kind of a funny turn of events, today the west side looks more like the east side, where the east side had uh, better water, uh, smaller communities, smaller farms, but they had a lot of uh, permanent crops. You found a lot of grape growers, almond growers, peach growers, all that stuff, and all the larger farms and row crop operations were out west. And as our water reliability got tougher and tougher and the state grew, we had more environmental redistributing of, of that water. Uh, we began looking more and more at where's our best return per acre foot like of water. I like redistributing as a word. That was a nice word. Yeah. <laughs> you, didn't, you, you didn't say stealing our water. No, I had to bite my lip on that. But anyway, <laughs> the, the, the point is we started looking at, uh, you know, uh, we, we wanted crops where California had global competitive advantage. Uh, and so we looked at almonds, we looked at pistachios and, and these other crops, and we were looking at our return per acre foot. What's crazy about it is these crops require more water than the row crops. So today, as you drive out there, you see more and more permanent crops that have greater demand on water with a dwindling water supply. And uh, so you're seeing the impact more on those row crops. And the row crops typically needed more labor. And so we're seeing the demand for labor shift as well as the cropping patterns. So let's look at pistachios and almonds. Let, let's look at your own farm. What, what percentage of your land now is devoted to nuts? Well, because we're in an area where uh, there's great water uncertainty, we assessed how much uh, uh, pumping capability we had on our farm. And we have about 33 deep wells to, to rely on but we need the surface water. And some of these crops are very sensitive to water quality and the groundwater is not as good. So in our situation, we figured out we don't want to plan more, plant more than about a third to these permanent crops. And we wanted to have permanent crops that if push came to shove and we didn't get our surface supply, that we could use, depend on the well water to keep them going. So we have a, a situation where we have this fantastic land. We're not developing all of it. And uh, we purposely grow, we're going back to growing like grain. Uh, and the reason we are is because we don't know how much water we're gonna get until after we've planted the crops every year. And we wanna plant a crop that like a year like this, if our allocation drops, we can walk away from that crop and any of those jobs um, and let it go. Uh, so we can protect the permanent crops. So okay. I think we're very good resource managers, but we're playing with this great uncertainty. And so it's causing us to maybe plant some of these crops that normally, if we knew what we were gonna get, we wouldn't grow at all. What percentage are almonds and pistachios going shipping overseas? Well, ours, uh, we, we purposely focus a little bit more on domestic uh, uh, consumption. But uh, with that said, I mean, we're probably exporting somewhere in the neighborhood of 60% of our almonds overseas, where the industry is doing probably closer to 75 or 80, and the pistachios. Uh, you know, we go through a couple different handlers at this point. We know a lot of them are getting exported, but there's a big chunk of that market, uh, snack market here in the U.S. Do you go through uh, Resnick to do your... We, we know Mr. Resnick very well. Uh, we go through some of his competitors, and it makes him very oh. angry. <laughs> <laughs> So your, your pistachios aren't marketed by that Korean hip-hop artist? On the, on, on not yet. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> Joe, trainer, tell us about what you've seen from your perch in Kern County outside. Is it, are you in Bakersfield or just near it? Well, I, I work out of Bakersfield. I pretty much cover the valley from Modesto South. I got in this game when I was a young one, like some of these panelists here, back in 1960, 61. Back then, there was maybe 100,000 acres of almonds in California. Now there's, as uh, Mark said, maybe 750,000, 800,000. The is name glut, of the, is a glut of almonds coming? I don't think so. There's very few places in the world you can grow almonds. Believe me, China has tried desperately to do it. 
the place that had the land don't have the water, the place that had the water don't have the climate. So it's a unique climate, they call it the Mediterranean climate. It has to be warm enough in the spring, February, when almonds bloom, actually almonds bloom in the middle of winter, uh, first part of February, so you don't get a frost. And uh, yet you had to be cold enough in January and December to break, uh, to uh, satisfy the chilling requirement, about 300 hours below 45 degrees. So Sacramento Valley, San Joaquin Valley is really unique in that regard. So China's gotten to pretty much every ag crop. They've ruined the apple market for temporarily, hopefully, for the Washington apple growers. They're into grapes, uh, almost every ag commodity except almonds. So uh, believe me, if they uh, wanted to get in almonds, they, they've tried. They, they haven't been able to do it. So you think the world market for almonds is just going to keep expanding and expanding and expanding? Well, the economy like, uh, now, like, like Stuart indicated, we send a tremendous amount of almonds to China. And China is really propping up the almond market as well as the market for almost, ag com almost all ag commodities. The whole ag industry is pretty much dependent on the Chinese economy. And right now it's doing fine. I don't know if you saw 60 Minutes about a month ago where they have a real estate bubble over there. Well, that, if that'll affect the economy, I don't know. But uh, as, as China goes, so goes the almond market, so goes the ag economy. So I'm optimistic. Uh, I think most almond growers are optimistic. You drive up and down the valley here, you'll see lots of sticks in the ground. Those sticks are, are young almond trees. Uh, banking on three dollar a pound almonds whereas 20 years ago there may be a dollar dollar and a half a pound so almond growers are doing great when i first got into this in 1960 beekeepers were charging two or three dollars a colony for almonds almond rental for the season at two colonies per acre this last year the price for many bees was up to two hundred dollars a colony it's two to two hundred and the new york times did a piece of uh, a week or so ago about a shortage of bees and how that shortage it just created this huge spike in the in, in the amount of money paid. Tell us about. I mean, you need a bee to to pollinate. I mean, it's not self pollinating like, like like a lot of crops. You need a bee to pollinate an almond. Every almond orchard you see in California is, is at least two varieties and, and some three varieties. You have to cross from one variety to another variety in order to set an almond. So uh, there's a new variety now called Independence where you don't have to have that crossing. It's very popular with growers. There's maybe out of the 800,000 acres now, maybe two or 3,000 acres of independence, but uh, it hasn't been totally proven as a, as a viable uh, uh, almond. I don't know, Stuart, do you have any? Uh, no, I not yet. Okay, a lot, a lot of growers are holding back until they see what the, how, things, uh, how things turn out as far as marketing that, but it's a lot, a lot of interest in the, in the independence variety. So the, this colony collapse, if we don't solve this, this could be the thing that might hold down almond production? Could well be, because like I say, the almond industry is totally dependent on the beekeepers. Beekeepers now are really totally dependent on the almond industry for income. Beekeepers no longer count on, on honey production or honey income. If they don't have almond income, they don't survive. So a terrific book on the subject is called The Beekeeper's Lament by Hannah Nord Nordhaus. It came out a couple of years ago. She paints, a, it's almost novelistic and, and read it in a Nonfiction, a uh, very readable book, and she follows a beekeeper from North Dakota to California through the cycle of the year. And uh, California is very in independent or, or dependent on North Dakota bees. Uh, a lot of California bees that spend the spend the uh, spring in, in, on the almonds. Uh, our valley here is the almond capital of the world during almond bloom, which we just finished a month ago. Uh, all those bees, or most of them, go to North Dakota. Uh, Wes indicated at lunch uh, problems with uh, more planting of ethanol, uh, corn, corn for ethanol. Corn is a lousy bee plant. There's more and more corn going into uh, North Dakota. As a result, my beekeepers are telling me their bees don't survive nearly as well as they did, say, five or 10 years ago. Another factor is CRP ground that they told me about. I wasn't familiar with that until I Googled it, and I suggest you do the same. CRP is Conservation Reserve Program, where the government pays farmers on prairie ground uh, not to plant crops. Uh, this is when there was a crop surplus. So the bees don't have anywhere to? Well, right now they don't. They're replanting with, they, they survive very well on, on, uh, on prairie ground uh, with natural clover. Now that prairie ground is going into corn and soybeans. Corn and soybeans are essentially lousy bee plants, so the bees 
A lot of CCD problem is malnutrition. Uh, bees suffer malnutrition uh, from lack of a good pollen source. Clover's yeah, I, I want to come back to, to that colony collapse. I want to sure. ask anybody on the panel, is anybody on the panel disturbed by the fact that in the last 20 years we've gone from 100,000 acres of almonds to 800,000? Is that a way that we should use our, our land and resources? Paul? Ha! You know, I, I think it's, it's uh, you can be say you're, you're disturbed, but I, what you're looking at is farmers making rational decisions in a marketplace that now has gone to um, considering China's economy um, and considering um, factors that go way beyond their control. And I think that the, the, it becomes part of a system of decision making and a system of, of the, the research that's developed in this room that supports that system. But it, in, 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 the, in the long haul, I think what you're seeing is uh, agronomic practices that are creating um, monocultures that, in fact, have problems. And maybe bees might be an indicator species of the fact that um, there's very little forage. There's very little um, diversity in the valley, very few you know, kind of diverse, di diversity for the, for the bee actually to, to uh, con consume different kinds of pollen and nectar to make it a healthy organism. Um, the fact is, if you pack bees up in a truck and you deliver them in the middle of the night, and they're, it'd be like taking, taking your kids to McDonald's and dropping them off and, and saying, this is what you're going to eat for the next two weeks, and there's nothing else there. And they do a good job of it, but in fact, you know, there's some, some real holes in the system of, of how we're, we're thinking about those crops and how we're thinking about what we need actually to support them. Does anybody um, buddy, want to piggyback on that, going from 100,000 to 800,000 of one crop? Is can it, the, I, is can it I, the best use? Can I talk about that just a little bit yes, from a Bill, political perspective? Having been an elected official in Ventura County, um, our county has probably as strong a system of agricultural protection policies as any county in the state. It's a voter-imposed set of urban growth boundaries uh, that makes it very, very difficult to change the agricultural zoning to anything else either uh, outside of the cities and limits the size of the cities also. Um, <clears throat> when the voters approved this system in about 1998 to 2000, I'm sure that what they were imagining they were doing was um, freeze drying the county as it existed at the time. I think it was a little bit, it's been a little bit of a surprise to them that what they now drive past every day is a significantly different agricultural landscape than it was 15 years ago uh, in two ways. Uh, one is that the row crops are being replaced by, I'm sorry, the tree crops are being replaced by row crops. Wait, 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 slow down. So it's the opposite of what's happening in the San Joaquin mm -hmm. Valley. You're saying that Tree crops are being replaced by row crops in the Oxnard Plain and elsewhere on the flatlands in Ventura County because why? Yeah, uh, because that's a much better return and a much higher value uh, uh, land price in Ventura County in the economics of Ventura County. Um, so I, one of, I think one of the things that 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 you're asking it seems to me is. Is it okay for California con to continue the pattern that it has followed for the last 140 years of moving up the value chain of crops? And, That's right. and my answer to that as a politician, as a former, mercifully former politician now, is um, from a agricultural land preservation perspective, which is what I know about, I don't know about farming, um, it, it is inevitable that if you lock if you lock the, the farmers into um, agricultural land in an area such as Ventura County where they could make a lot more money doing something else, um, they're just gonna go up the value chain faster. And, and that's what's happened. And I, I'm not sure, I understand, I'm not sure that's a good thing or a bad thing, I, it, but it's a continuation and I think an acceleration of the pattern we've seen since we started moving out of wheat in the, what, 1870s or 1880s into other things. It's, so the, yeah, so the farmer's first obligation is to feed his family, okay? And then you look at that in the aggregate and you start seeing how certain acres are piling up and what that means for all of us as a state and, 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 a, and a country and the world. Um, any other comments on this idea of, of growing what's profitable? We can understand it, but that sometimes it may take us down a road that isn't completely wise. Yes, Larry. I grew up uh, on a small family 
farm growing our own food. In fact, I remember my shock when I got to Stanford for graduate school from mid-Missouri and bought a tomato, and I tried to eat it, and I just I couldn't imagine that people actually paid money for these things. Uh, you know, it was like cardboard. Um, but during the last, um, I'm 65, I guess, this year, uh, during that next intervening 40 or 50 years, something terribly wrong has, has happened with the coupling of the food generation to the human consumption of food, and that's the obesity epidemic. Um, it's clear that just allowing market-optimized creation of food-like stuff that you then feed to people indiscriminately is um, crossing over from the food and agricultural sector into the health and medical sector. And so, I mean, it was so shocking just literally a couple of months ago when the Global Burden of Disease study came out with uh, their statistic that worldwide, three times as many people are dying of obesity and overweight problems than malnutrition. And so somehow, we've got to look at a systems approach here that involves the actual biochemical mechanisms inside human beings for dealing with ingesting food and the result of where that food goes. Does it feed fat cells or not? Uh, that has to do basically with your glucose insulin system and whether you're spiking it. Uh, you know, just go to the Harvard study on sugar and you find out that consuming one sugary <coughs> soft drink a day, this was over a very large study, uh, increases your chance of cardiovascular disease by 20%. What should we be growing then in California if we followed that model? What would, would be growing? Well, I think the question more is, this is not just, it's how would you even begin to answer that system in a political, social, economic context? I mean, what are the tools that you need to come up with that? I mean, you can't tell someone they should be doing growing this or selling that until you have a better understanding of why is there a continuing four-decade obesity epidemic. You know, in, in 2000, in, in the latest census, in 2011, not a single one of the 50 states lowered its fraction of people with BMI over 30 of, say, obesity. <laughs> Not one. I mean, it's still going up. And it's not a public health emergency. I mean, to me, as a scientist, a lifetime scientist, the biggest scandal is that, that something like this, the biggest health dysfunction in American history, is not considered an enormous emergency from a public health point of view. And therefore, things are being put in place to reverse it. But take it back to the crops, though. I want to. Well, high glycemic carbohydrates are what make people fat. And if, and if you look at the base of the food pyramid, that's what it is. So there's, there's if you want to, the long history of this, read Good no, Calories don't, and Cal but... Cal Bad Calories um, by Gary Taubes, who is a reporter for Science. Oh, yeah, I went to school with Gary. But, but you know, and he takes you back to where, how did that, how could we possibly have gotten into this situation, including the McCover and hearings and the Princeton and Yale nutritionists and all that stuff. Um, but you get into this, the we discussion we heard this morning about these cultural things. If, if, if the only thing that, that is inexpensive to buy is high glycemic carbohydrates, then you're going to see the kind of obesity that we see all over the world. Every indigenous peoples around the world, when the Western diet showed up of refined flour, sugar, uh, and so forth, they all became obese, whether it's in this country or other countries. So, I mean, people have, there's plenty of studies on this, but how, in a, in a systems point of view, you can readjust things is beyond my pay grade, but it, you know, as far as posing not what Linda's the question is. So we're going to hear Linda talk about this next. Go ahead, yes. Linda. Um, if I were to go back to the crops we have and the diversity and impact, um, also your question of whether 
um, it is okay to um, allow the farmers to select the crops that they will grow. Personally, I think uh, it's a matter of policy, obviously, but personally, I think it will be a mistake to regulate that. Um, if you look at Europe and what they're doing, uh, South Europe uh, primarily being mostly agricultural, they lost a lot of their agriculture and their effectiveness because there is too much of, of, of regulation. And I think they, the fact that we here provide this flexibility for the farmer to make the appropriate decision, it has helped the industry a lot. Uh, but if I were to go and uh, connect with um, Larry's comments, I think he's absolutely correct. We do have a problem in the US primarily, but I would say in other developing countries um, and, uh, of obesity and diabetes. But uh, the, what is interesting is that problem is mostly with communities that find themselves in poverty because there is a broad availability of low cost, low quality food and very little education. So I will always, what you're gonna hear me primarily saying today is that um, in my mind, the solution to this is not so much regulation or overregulation. You cannot just regulate some of these things, but I think it's mostly education. Okay. And that has to start very early. When you, when you live in the San Joaquin Valley and you see the crop patterns, it's very fascinating. A few years ago, everybody was jumping on the pomegranate bandwagon, okay? <laughs> it was because of palm. I mean, literally, there are fields in orchards in Madeira that were planted three, four years ago to pomegranates, and they've been pulled out already. So speak to that a little bit, Stuart, about those decisions. Do we need more regulation, or should we allow the farmer just to look at his neighbor and say, wow, the neighbor's planting palms. I better plant mine now. And then we never know what's happening in the aggregate, and then pretty soon we're facing another glut. I mean, we've had a lot of gluts. We had too many Thompson seedless grapes too many raisins, so we had to pull out 30,000 acres of those. Tree fruit on the east side, had to pull out 30,000 acres of those to find some kind of equilibrium. So should government, should the university get more involved in bringing that all together and saying, hey, we're moving toward a place where it's gonna be a potential glut, and we have to pull all that out? Or should each individual farmer do that in a, in a vacuum, or is yeah. he doing it in a vacuum? Well, I think, I think the role of the university in many ways is to help provide information for, for individual growers and make better decisions. Um, you know, in our case, uh, we decided we wanted to grow crops where we had a competitive growing advantage here in California. Uh, we wanted to grow crops that we could mechanize because we were concerned about the labor uh, issues. We wanted to grow crops that had a high nutritional profile because we thought over the course of time as issues of, of obesity and you know, what you were eating, we thought, you know, you look at a Mediterranean diet, California offers all these crops. Yeah. So we thought, well, almonds are nutritious, uh, you don't have to refrigerate, you can market them throughout the, the world. Um, every culture in the world likes eating nuts. So that took us to pistachios, that, you know, down this, this list. Um, you know, the guys, and we looked at growing some pomegranates because we had some very tough ground and pomegranates you could grow on the sidewalk. So, yes. uh, <laughs> but we didn't, and the reason was we realized, look, this is all being driven by one guy who's been incredibly successful. But, uh, you know, we wanted something a little bit big, bigger and broader than that to make that decision. But, you know, I think you have to allow the growers to make those decisions. And, and the, the research and the, the, the statistical data and what have you that comes out of the university, we find incredibly valuable. I wanna follow this with our two other farmers, then we're gonna move into the movements that were founded, food, how you deliver food better, all that, and then we're gonna talk about poverty too. Go ahead, go ahead, Glenn. Well, I, I'm gonna follow up that comment because I, I think what you said a minute ago, the question, should government get into f decisions farmers make? Gov government's already there, they've been there for decades. It's, it's subsidies in the farm bill, it's, it's regulations, it's, it's which research gets funded and which research doesn't get funded. It's, it's dozens of different ways that government is deeply engaged 
in what farmers are doing. It's, it's subsidizing oil so that it's cheaper to ship almonds to China to get knocked out of the shell, back on a ship to Indonesia to get cleaned, back on a ship to go somewhere else to be put in a plastic past package. I, I watched, I was at in the port of Oakland a few years ago where a ship, they, they said that's what was going on with the almonds in that ship. I couldn't believe it. I mean, government has been deeply engaged in this for, well, I, I'd say 150 some years, the land grant, the, the, the Homestead Act, I mean, the, the Morrill Act, I mean, we, we've been deeply, deeply engaged. The question now is, and this is a big debate that's been going on for at least the last few decades is, how can government policy start turning that giant ship around a little bit in the middle of the ocean. In fact, that's the essence of farm bill debates for, I'd say at least since the 85 farm bill when we started talking about environmental issues. And folks need to realize it's very recent that this whole discussion of food came up. I can tell you, and anybody here who's worked farm bill can tell you, during the 2002 farm bill, you rarely heard the word food mentioned in the debate at all. And during the 0708 farm bill, it was half the discussion because all of a sudden the obesity and the health and the physicians and a lot of folks got interested, poverty, food stamps, all of that got deeply engaged, a lot of new players in the 0708 farm bill. This farm bill that we're going on right now, all those new players are still there and we've got the economy now that's a big, big player and, and is going to be affecting policy choices. Paul, take us, take us to your farm the decisions that are made, the crops that are grown, how it might be different from Stewart's, similar to Stewart's? Well, you know, so, so a lot of farms um, survive by having a very single focus, and that focus is production. And the, and the mantra that for years has been um, more production at lower cost. That's how you survive, basically. And, and public policy has, and a lot of the research, frankly, has, has driven that. And back in 1982, I went to, my, to a farm meeting about low grain prices, and Tom Kearney, who was our farm advisor at that time, basically said, well, boys, it looks like you're just going to have to produce a little more for a little less. And, and that's the paradigm. And so on our farm, I think we saw that. We saw actually the, 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 the uh, systemic failure of, of, of the land-grant institutions, I think, really to understand the social dimension what was happening to rural economies and what was happening to rural peoples. And, and that transition from a largely agrarian society in the last 100 years to one that has less than 2% of the population, probably less than that if you really looked at who's truly producing, has been a tragedy that I, think, I don't think has, has been uh, talked about very much. And so, so when we looked at it, how, how do we farm, how do we enter the market, how do we think about our production, we had to think that um, that's, that's a trend that's continuing. And, and we're not doing a whole lot to thwart that trend. We're not doing a whole lot to do what was talked about this morning. How do you value rural peoples? How do you elevate agricultural production to something that's important and part of the, the statewide dialogue in terms of having a healthy economy and the foundation of that economy being sound? How do you keep stewards there on the land? I think is a, are there, those are huge fundamental questions that I think a lot of you work at, work at all the time. But, but so, so our design of our farm was looking to do, in a sense, what Stuart's doing, look at the factors that we had that we could control and try to minimize our risk. Um, how do we approach the marketplace? Because primarily we realized we, we, we couldn't uh, enter agriculture. I, I started as a beginning farmer from a farm family, but started my own farm without a lot of resources back in 1984. And it was that you had to uh, rethink the paradigm. You simply couldn't battle it out with people who had land, had resources, had all, everything they needed to be good producers who were actually failing. And the ones who have succeeded are the ones, I think, have, who have done a lot of taking the advice of, that's come out of the university about um, um, accelerating your capital uh, expenditures, um, looking at buying the, the technology that will keep you uh, in the saddle and keep you keep you one step ahead so that the first adapters were, were generally the ones that, that, that got there and, and stayed in business. But what they did is it created a race toward production and, and it stopped considering all the dimensions of stewardship that I think a farmer needs to be thinking about. So our farm is multifaceted. We have, uh, it's a polyculture. We have animals in our system. We produce a good, we primarily fresh market vegetables. We approach our market directly. We look for people who will understand what we're doing and support us in the marketplace, not an elite agriculture or um, um, some kind of um, elitist type of consumption, but rather people who are gonna pay us for stewardship. 
which I think a lot of farmers um, need to begin to put into their equation and are just beginning a conversation about how do you pay for stewardship services on a, on a farm, how do you reward farmers for good agricultural practices. And, and um, we've, it's, it's a multi-dimensional agriculture with fruits, nuts, um, and we approach the local marketplace by, by creating a, a story. So we basically have look for a place that we have sanctuary in. And um, I see a lot of young farmers beginning to look for that at that, this, at that same place. And that, you know, if we talked about the global issues of, of how you um, create viable agricultures in, in, in third world countries, first of all, you have to think about the contradiction in, in the urban, urban population wants cheaper food. And if you could just elevate the price paid to farmer a little bit, that, that right. would create a, a tremendous viability, a tremendous factor of, of, of a stability. And if that, that price were to be regular so that you didn't, didn't see the booms and busts, but you created a floor, you'd see investment, you'd see other things happening, you'd see women being empowered. All of those things are, are linked to, to the marketplace. Um, and and you, you, can't, you can't discount the fact that you have to be a good farmer and do all the fundamentals right. And it's not some magic thing that's going to come or the silver bullet that will save you. Basically, you have to practice the fundamentals very, very well. You have to use what technology you can employ that serves your um, ultimate survival. But actually, you have to also think about um, how this is going to you know, go into multiple generations. So that's, that's kind of what we're working on. David, when you were making your finding this, this whole idea of supporting farmers in and around a university, it's a billion dollars, right, of buying power? It's that, five billion. Five billion? Mm -hmm. Okay. The UC system alone was how much? Eight, eight, 88? About 88 million. I okay. Um, I'm assuming that Paul's kind of farm, which is closer maybe to that Jeffersonian ideal than, than some others, that would be the kind of farm you're talking about in supporting? It's a, a, it's I don't know the details, but it sounds like it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so tell us why. I mean, um, yeah. Tell us why your generation values that and, and why it makes sense. Yeah, well, I mean, I think for a lot of the, the young people my generation, the students that I get to work with, the Real Food Challenge, what we're looking at is a situation where our generation is expected to live shorter lives than our parents uh, because of the food we're eating, as, as was just spoken about. And that's the first time in American history that's the case. Um, we're looking at a, a generation that will see increased and in, in more volatile uh, weather patterns, climate change, uh, increased con uh, consolidation of wealth into fewer and fewer hands. Uh, big problems. And, and I, I think more to the point, what people are seeing is, is, is that this is starting to become a new normal. We have a generation who, who has never seen anything else. And that, for me, is incredibly disturbing. Uh, some folks here might, might ha have a memory of a, of a different type of agriculture that existed. Um, and the fact is, it, it's, there's a study by the Kellogg Foundation a few years ago that said that if you look at uh, healthy, fresh, affordable, um, fair food, it's less than 2% of our, of our food economy. You, you just can't find uh, food that doesn't have one hidden cost or let, another. Let me stop you one second. I, yeah. I, wa I want you to go back a step. Sure. Tell us how this idea just came to you where you were at, yeah. what bugged you, and then where, where have you taken it? I mean, it sounds like it's going global, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, sure. I, I mean, m my story actually goes well before college. I grew up in an in inner city urban environment that was pretty much a food desert. Um, I was bused to school 45 minutes, past block after block of abandoned uh, um, supermarkets filled with bodegas, other small grocers. So the, the issues of, of food injustice for me um, go back to my childhood. Uh, now, I, I came at it from a different perspective in college where I started to actually get involved with, with some local farmers near my university, learning from them, finding farmer mentors out in the field because I didn't find that the style of education in our universities was, was actually uh, giving me the, the knowledge I wanted. And, and it just so happened that one of those, those farmers who I was working with, a woman by the name of Kristen, um, she went out of business about a year after I started, I started working with her. And, and for me to find that my university was spending uh, six and a half million dollars on food every single year, uh, but not value, but you know, and having these great liberal arts values, public, you know, uh, for the public good, uh, but uh, shipping those dollars off to who knows where 
when there was producers in our community uh, around the university that upheld the same values that we did, that were thinking about uh, land stewardship, that were thinking about uh, treating their workforce in fair, fair ways. So, you know, that starts with the, big, the small concept. Young people come to this for any number of different reasons, whether it's health and nutrition, whether it's the social justice aspect. Um, but what we're finding is that this is a growing movement. I mean, on hundreds of college campuses around the country, you'll find young people who are, who are clamoring uh, for what we, we like to call real food. Um, and, and luckily, we have institutions that are responding. Um, at UC Davis, Tom Tomich and the folks at the uh, ASI, I mean, are building a whole new sustainable agriculture uh, uh, programs for study. At UC Santa Cruz, the Center for Agroecology and Sustainable Food Systems, it's, it's happening. And, and thankfully, the UC system is actually, on, uh, on a system-wide level, has instituted a sustainable food policy, mandating that at least 20% of all food procured by the university system comes from local and sustainable uh, growers. So it's, it's, it's happening, and it's, it's a growing movement. Um, but it, I, I feel like these, these issues are, are, are deeply troubling and, and moral ones that we have to grapple with. I, I myself, I spent some time uh, uh, with uh, farm workers here in California a few years ago, and the situation, if, if, if it hasn't been discussed yet today. I no, mean, we will get discussed it. Okay, we can, me. we can come to it, to it. Oh, yeah. It, it, it just, I think it, it lends a sense of urgency. When you see women working in the fields, incredible pace of, of work, incredible heat, swaddled so that only their eyes are visible. Has anyone seen, seen women working in fields like this? And, and I asked, you know, why is this the case? Why, why uh, all this? Is, is, it, is it the pesticide exposure? Why, why are you protecting yourselves in this way? And what I heard was it was about sexual assault. It was about rape. That if they weren't covered, they were afraid they'd be attacked by their crew leaders, by the labor contractors. Um, we, we, have a, we have a system of agriculture that you know, may be producing wealth in some places, but it's actually producing a, a great deal of, of, of violence and, and poverty in others. And so uh, speaking from a generational point of view, we, we've inherited this, but, but I don't think we can stand for it. Um, and so uh, as young people, Um, you know, we have many different tools at our fingertips, um, cultural as well as economic, and, and I think the, the levers of the university and the, and the resources there are a big one. And so that's what you're seeing. You're seeing students standing up and, and fighting for universities to allocate their resources in a way that's going to produce a more just and sustainable okay. food system. That's a nice segue to Como, but I'm going to take a little, little detour for just one second. So here we have Stuart Wolf, who grows some of the finest you know, nuts and in, in, in vegetables in the state of California, pays his people very well, um, has a lot of acres, but it's a family farm. Okay? Uh, they're demonized as corporate farmers, but everybody in that business is a family, and they bought it from a family. Um, he is, what, 175 miles away from UC Berkeley. When UC Berkeley buys its pistachios and almonds, should it buy it from Stewart? that question to me? Yeah, I mean, if based on what we've developed in the Real Food Challenge, I, I would say, I would say. What's the list? What, what, yeah, what, I would say absolutely. Okay. Uh, I mean, we, we're talking about uh, a system that is, is, any improvement over the status quo is great. <laughs> we're, we're, not, we're not trying to make the perfect enemy of the good, as people say. This is not an ideological movement. This is about uh, practically supporting uh, uh, farmers that have, have practices that are, that are uh, better than what is often the status quo. So whether it's local to the institution, great, let's do it. If it's organic, great, let's do it. If there's fair labor practices, great, let's do it. If it's one, any one of those, great, let's do it. Um, we, we, have to, we have to move forward. We have to move forward together. Komal, go ahead. Talk, tell us about your movement you founded, how it came maybe from, some, from the same uh, sensibilities as David's. Sure. Um, so I grew up in Las Vegas, which is the city of excess and in every capacity. And, um, you know, Berkeley, you know, we're such a he head of sustainability and, and, and social justice, and yet you can't walk anywhere in Berkeley without seeing poverty. You can't escape it. And yet, at the same time, you know, you go to our dining halls, which are also supposed to be sustainable and green, and you go to International House, you go to sororities and fraternities, and you know, hundreds and hundreds of pounds of food is thrown away. And this is a daily, 
this is daily. This is consumable food that is perfectly good. Um, you know, Haas School of Business has, you know, on average maybe 10 to 15 events a day. And how much food is, you know, left over? Even think about the the lunch we had today. How much food was left over? The the dinner we had last night. How much food was left over? And yet, there's 50 million Americans that go hungry every day. And that's, I mean, it's absurd. You know, in the wealthiest country in the world, one in six adults go hungry. One in four children go hungry. And even I mean, even on campus, you know, people make that decision every day. Am I going to pay for books? Am I going to pay for rent? Or am I going to eat? And so, you know, I don't think that, you know, I would, I would kind of disagree with the chancellor in the sense that it's not just about education. I think that, you know, at least in the college level, most of us are educated. We know that we're supposed to eat right. We know, you know, what are the good things to eat. But at the same time, like, if we can't afford it, it doesn't really matter how educated you are. It doesn't matter if, you know, if farmers markets have, you know, if the price for organic food is double or triple, and you know you're buying from local farmers, and yeah, great, you support your local farmers, but if it's you know double or triple the cost, I mean we're ballers on a budget, you know it's 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 not feasible to actually at the college level, maybe for universities to purchase from local farmers, but for us to purchase from local farmers, for us to go into you know Whole Foods and and get the best quality food we can. It, it's really impossible. So what if your troops were deployed uh, last night after the, the, the dinner we had where there were bowls of potato salad still left, everything else? What would you guys have done here locally to match up that banquet table to the hungry? Yeah, sure. So basically, you know, what I started was uh, an organization called Bear Abundance, and what we did was we did exactly, we t recovered excess consumable food from just on-campus events and dining halls and then redistributed it into our community. But it was more just, you know, kind of a grassroots movement of really identifying who were the homeless shelters, you know, suitcase clinic, different boys and girls club. Um, but th there was still an inefficiency in that. So, uh, you know, for instance, Cal Dining would give me, they would call me and say, hey, we have a 500 sandwiches left over from, from an event that basically no one came to. And um, so, you know, I, I would come and I, I would pile all that food in the car and then I would spend the next four to five hours trying to identify, you know, the different shelters nearby that could accept, you know, some food. And they'd say, yeah, you know, I'll take 10 sandwiches. Well, great, I have 490 sandwiches left and I just drove, you know, an hour to you. And it's just, it's a, it's a waste of my time as a volunteer. It's a waste of, you know, resources and it's, it's, it's kind of, it was very difficult for me to, you know, justify the fact that how, how is it possible that 50 million Americans go hungry and yet I can't find them when I have this food? <laughs> and so basically what I, what I thought about was, you know, how can we use the technology that we already have for social good? You know, what do we carry around every day with us is, is our mobile phones. So how cool would it be if any donor, any person after a corporate event or after, you know, a bat mitzvah, a wedding, whatever, goes onto their mobile phone, logs onto feedingforward.com and says, you know, hey, we have, we have 100 sandwiches left over, we have potato salad left over, and uh, it needs to be picked up by, you know, 8 p.m. tonight, here's who my secretary's contact info, here's my contact info, and it'll automatically geolocate you. And then that information will be sent to our, our virtual marketplace, which will ping uh, via text and email organizations nearby who have signed up. Um, and have been vetted through our system. So, you know, some organizations need food on Mondays, some organizations need food on Fridays, and really kind of de decipher and automate that system so that, you know, we're feeding people when they need it the most. And uh, we're really getting the food that, you know, is, is so, you know, 263 million pounds of food. So just imagine the largest football stadium in the entire world, which would be actually Michi University of Michigan, um, filled to the absolute brim. That's how much food we waste just in America alone. And this is not like orange peels or eggshells. This is consumable food, not just from our plates, but from buffets, from, you Talk know. Like a weekly, daily? What, what, this is daily. This is a daily, you know, phenomenon. And if you saved even just 5% of that food from going, waste to going to waste, you'd feed 4 million people. And 15%, you'd feed 20 million people. And you know, this is something that we can definitely do. This, I mean, it's not a lack of resources in America. It's an inequitable distribution of those resources. And if, we, if this mobile app, if this movement can make that more equitable and, and feed all of our communities in, in the way that I know it can and that I know the way it has, then that would be spectacular. So Larry, that's kind of what thank I'm Thank you. Thinking. Larry, you were nodding, um, obviously, as a technology guru. What do you think really technology can save us 
in, uh, in, from hunger? I mean, the cell phone? <laughs> Uh, yeah, what she's doing is is using the new infrastructure that didn't exist five or ten years ago. I mean, there are now over a billion cell phones, and they all SMS. They all they all at minimum do that sort of messaging. And, and so the ability um, and they're you know a large fraction are connected to the internet. So there is a social network capability to bring together the people who need something with the people who've got something that we just couldn't imagine doing, even 10 years ago. Just not, couldn't imagine. Now it's totally routine and free, by the way. Mm -hmm. You've already paid for it with Great. the phone and the service, just use it. Yeah. And so it takes folks like this that have this kind of vision to, uh, which sadly tend to be younger people. Uh, although, <laughs> I just wanna say that some of the <clears throat> older folks are like a couple times your age, like me, <laughs> Um, totally share the vision and the values that you just mentioned. And in fact, I, our family, it's completely gone to local organic food. And if we do eat meat, it's only grass fed and, and, and so forth and from sustainable, um, you know, places. And so I think it isn't just an age thing. It, it, it's a much broader movement, but this ability to use the fact that we now have a virtual set of bits distributed across the physical world opens up opportunities that have been never dreamed of. And, and, and it's only beginning to, you know, dawn on people. And this sort of innovation is, uh, it may not save us, but it is one of the most optimistic things. And the University of California system is where a lot of this innovation is happening. Uh, a lot of the information technology, telecommunication, I mean, my institute, that's its name. Um, you know, this is the sort of thing Berkeley, et cetera, so others are doing mm -hmm. is inventing these capabilities out of this infrastructure, which then applications like this can make much better use of than having to sit down and start writing, you know, C code from scratch. <laughs> okay, I, I'm gonna, I wanna work some others into the conversation. Glenna, go ahead. Uh, you wanna piggyback on that technology uh, point? No, actually, I wanted to jump on that beautiful word he brought up that wasn't discussed in the first panel and desperately needs to be discussed here. Go ahead. Infrastructure. Um, we, we talked, th there was a couple words about infrastructure this morning, as in highways and long railways, and that's, that's cool, that's infrastructure. But if we're going to truly start shifting food systems, we got to look at all the infrastructure in between the farm and the fork in a completely different way. And that's one of the things that we're having a very hard time getting people to look at. We've, we've got to look at the, the processing, the distribution, the cold storage, the slaughterhouses. We've got to look at things like access to commercial kitchens and aggregation hubs. The school district that wants to have healthy food in their lunch, they can't have 50 farmers backing up a truck to the door in the morning. And yet there's nothing that really facilitates somebody like Paul getting his stuff into those easily. Some people have built it but it's been an uphill battle. And it's not even just that too, it's things like extension. We've had a lot of discussion today about research, but there's been very little discussion here actually about on the ground, applied, getting stuff happening, extension. Um, mobile phones are cool, but if we can't actually have cold storage in places that medium sized and small farmers can utilize, we're not gonna make those local farm systems work. How about farmer's markets? We all love them. Tell us about Farmer's mm. markets are beautiful. I love them. I love mine. I'm sure most people here use them and love yours too. And I think they are a, a lovely tool in a very big toolbox that needs a lot more tools. And, and one of the dirty little secrets about farmer's markets, because this is a problem I run into a lot when we're trying to actually deal with infrastructure, like, like that middle scale infrastructure, too many of the people that are activists in the food system have come to this horrible black and white dichotomy. Big is bad, small is beautiful, and there's nothing in between they even wanna talk about. So yeah, let's have more farmer's markets. We're not gonna feed 38 million people in this state via farmer's markets. And even if we were to try, then let's bring the climate change people in and start talking about carbon footprint. Because farmer's markets are the worst carbon footprint in the entire food system. Yeah, I know, they're driving from the valley up and over the mountain into LA. I want to go to Grant, 
because Grant's going to tee us up on, on GMOs, um, and then we can go to Alan on that. Grant, when we were talking, I did interviews with everybody beforehand, you were telling me about this wheat that you grow right there along the Colorado River, right? In the corner, is that where you're at? A weed? Wheat, wheat, not oh. wheat. <laughs> <laughs> no, we do grow wheat, you know, you're, but it's you're, not intentional. You're, you're not in Humboldt, I know that. Okay. <laughs> Go straight to Berkeley. No. Wheat, wheat. Okay, tell us about that wheat, what it is, where it ends up going, how, you know, where it ends up coming back. Tell us about that whole process. Well, Alan can speak much better about the GMO issue than I can. Maybe no, you're going to tee up the GMO shot. issue for him. I don't want you to tell us but, about your farm. But if I can just make a couple of quick comments on some of the things Go that ahead. you said. Um, I'd first like to thank uh, the University of California for this opportunity to come and speak here today because Blythe, where we farm, is the eastern portion of Riverside County. It is as far east in the state of California as you can go before you get into Arizona. So the good news is that we are 100 miles from anything, and the bad news is we're 100 miles from everything. Um, <clears throat> But in all seriousness, we do have a farm advisor, and that farm advisor becomes our link from field work. It becomes our avenue for intellectual properties, and it becomes this conduit for farmers to try things and get some input from the cooperative extension system. And so it is. I, I want to thank everybody that's a part of that, and I know everybody out here is a big part of it. Give us a sense so, of a challenge you had on the farm that was <clears throat> solved by the UC. Well, you know what? We have a, a, a group that we get together once a, once a month, and we have a speaker come out, and oftentimes they're speakers from the University of California Cooperative Extension System, and they come and talk to us about some field trials, some research they've done. And it's an opportunity. It just seems kind of funny, but, you know, there are 25 growers. We get together. We talk about these things, and some of them are ideas that we're kind of talking about today a little bit in some respects. They're way out there, but we all of a sudden say, you know, maybe there's a possibility there. Or an older guy stands up and says, huh, hey, listen here, young man. We tried that 15 years ago, and it didn't work. And somebody might say, well, we got some other ways that we might try it again. So uh, I wanted to mention that. Um, the other thing is, <clears throat> you know, we've, we, the question came up of should somebody, the government, dictate what our cropping plan can be? Not and dictate, but just suggest, maybe. <laughs> suggest. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, as, as farmers, we make decisions on what crops to grow based on available infrastructure, which you just talked about. Um, it's available markets. It's trying to figure out creative ways to uh, market your product with some value-added benefit. And Whole Foods and Clark Nutrition and some of those grocery stores have done a brilliant job marketing their fruits and vegetables and produce. They've done a fantastic job with it. The reality is uh, we have good, nutritious, available, cost-effective produce available to us today, m much more so than any other nation in the world. I talked to a friend that had gone to Bermuda, and he paid $5 for a tiny cantaloupe that in, our, in California, it would have been called in the first sweep. It never would have made it to the market. But $5 because they can't produce their own food. Tell us about your wheat. I, I, I'm so, fascinated okay. by your wheat. <laughs> so, so we grow a desert Durham variety of wheat. Uh, it's, it's in our valley. We grow it in our valley, in the Yuma Valley, in Imperial Valley, and the Mexicali Valley. So we're, I'm kind of going uh, in a straight southern. Um, How long have you been growing it? How long? 
We've been, well, my grandfather started our farm. Uh, we've been growing wheat on and off for... No, that kind of wheat. Uh, this kind of wheat for probably the last 25 years. Um, it's sold through um, a marketer, and then it's shipped to Italy. It's used to make uh, fresh pasta, and then it's shipped back to the United States. Now say that, wait, 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 wait. Say, say that again. Okay, you grow it, not in Humboldt, but on that southern, okay. Right. It, you ship it to get it processed. Do we have places in the United States that would do that? You know, I don't know. Oh. Would anybody know if we have places in the U.S. to? I would think so. I would think they do. Probably not, because over the last 20 or 30 years, um, a lot of those places have gone out of business due to cheap fuel, high labor, uh, food safety, policies, local land use, a dozen different reasons. It, it varies product to product. Yeah, we keep hearing this idea of uh, we grow the strawberries and then we should be dipping the strawberries in the chocolate, okay? It sounds like you should be probably sending your wheat to somewhere in the United States, but maybe there isn't. It, it. So what do they do to it back there and then it comes back and it sells where? All over the U.S.? As what? Borelli or? Yeah, it's a variety of different manufacturers. I, and, and frankly, probably so many I couldn't even name them. Okay. Talk about, you were talking when we had our conversation on the phone about um, the way those, all those toys coming from China, we ended up on those ships, we ended up, they ended up going back empty, so we decided to put something on them, which makes sense. And so tell us about that. Well, a, a fair amount of the alfalfa production um, both in California, Arizona, uh, Oregon, and, and Washington uh, is sold to exporters that export that alfalfa and, and a variety of other forage grasses. They export it to Japan, to China, to uh, the UAE, to Saudi Arabia, and some of that is just because the UAE and Saudi Arabia has decided that they're not going to use any available water well, we for agricultural production. Yes. So they've just okay. well, said no more. Um, and there were some people in the Pacific Northwest that recognized that a lot of these ships were coming over carrying goods from China being delivered to the United States. And they were going back to China effectively on an empty backhaul. So they figured, hey, what, what kind of rates will you give us to put some containers on there and send them back? And they got, it was a, just a cheap alternative to a, a free backhaul. So the, the alfalfa is going back to Asia? Some of, none, none of the alfalfa that we produce, but some of it is, okay, yes. Okay, and then it's, it's going for cows and milk? It goes for cows, it goes for dairies, it goes for camels. Um, a variety of things, yeah. yeah. Is your alfalfa GMO? No. What, what is, what, on your land, what is GMO? Uh, we have 100% of our cotton that we grow is GMO. Okay, tell us, what, what does that mean? Does that mean that it's, it's uh, it can take Roundup Ready? Is, is that what it? It's Roundup Ready. It means that uh, the principal herbicide that's used is glyphosate or Roundup. Um, <clears throat> but it's also, it's, it's really been genetically modified, both principally for the insect resistance to the pink bollworm, and, and then secondary for the weed resistance uh, with the glyphosate. Um, but it's allowed us to grow a crop that almost 25 years ago, we just couldn't, couldn't grow anymore because of the pink bollworm. So, <clears throat> we're now on our second generation of uh, herbicide resistance and insect resistance with that crop. It's, okay. it's really revolutionized the agricultural industry. The global panel talked about GMOs, and, and I was in and out. I don't know if they addressed the more righteous uses of GMOs. I think they did. They talked about rice. 
Um, so far, a lot of folks have complained that the, the way we've used GMOs to this point is to really enhance the, the bottom line of the makers of pesticides and herbicides. So in Alan has written a book about this, and I wanted to ask him a little bit about where, where are the GMOs going? Um, is it fair to say that, um, and we'll hear from the, the, the young generation on the panel, how they feel about GMOs. Where are they going? The, uh, Pandora's basket, I'm, I'm sure it's mixed. Tell us about that, and, and how will GMOs end up helping feed the world someday? It, it, Best case scenario. Well, uh, thanks, Mark, for giving me 45 minutes to uh, <laughs> address this issue. Um, I, my, my technical background uh, is in molecular genetics. I started as a basic scientist. I was curious about DNA. And uh, it didn't escape my attention, Mark, that when you were introducing us, I, I missed the youngin moniker. Um, but <laughs> it wasn't really that long ago uh, when, I, when I learned about DNA. Um, as I say, as a basic scientist, I am, uh, I spent my entire professional career in public universities and I'm dedicated to the public good. Taxpayers pay my salary and I figure my job is to try to help explain to them the uh, technical details of modern genetics, including DNA, including recombinant technologies, in a, uh, in a manner that they can understand and process themselves. I'm not a salesman for the, the technology or any particular products. Um, again, as an academic and as a public servant, I don't think it's my job to tell people what they should do, but rather when I'm interacting, whether it's with the public or farmers, to give them the uh, ins and outs, the pros and cons, the benefits and the consequences of their decisions. But then the final decision is really up to them uh, you know, to decide what they want to grow. Farming is a difficult business. I have great respect for farmers. I could never do it myself, right? I just, I'm filled with trepidation at the thought of, of taking on that business. Um, but one of the few benefits they have is that they are largely independent. They make a lot of uh, management decisions on their own. So I, I think there would be a lot of recoil if we took that away and told farmers what they should or should not grow. Anyway, uh, back to the point. Um, genetic modification as we know it, as we talk about it now, whether it's the BT cotton uh, or the Roundup Ready soybeans, is first of all an obsolete technology. Right? It was developed in the 70s, uh, developed into crops in the 80s and early 90s, and those are predominantly the crops that our farmers and worldwide, the GM crops that uh, farmers are growing now. Right? 20 year old technology. Um, we haven't heard about synthetic biology today or nanotechnology, or some of the other technologies, we call them emerging technologies, that really will displace that traditional uh, view of genetic modification that, that we tend to hold. Well, talk about that a little bit. Slow it down just a little bit, because that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Well, um, we have uh, one of the issues, common issues in the public with genetic modification is that, uh, first of all, it's controlled by corporate interests. Right? Um, to a large extent, that's true. I mean, there's a couple of, uh, of big companies that really have the lion's share of the market. But why do we as a public entity cede that market to those big companies? I don't want to use the M word, but <laughs> there's a lot, and you may not be aware of this, there's been a tremendous amount of work developing beneficial, sustainable crops using genetic technologies in the public sector um, at one time, the USDA was the second largest developer of transgenic plants, tester of transgenic plants. Change. We have a large number of public universities, and private universities for that matter, and even small companies that have been developing products for the public good. Those uh, have been through various stages of uh, development and testing, field trials, uh, commercial, um, pre-commercial testing, and so on. And where are they now? Well, a very small number actually on the market. Uh, Virus-resistant papaya saved the industry in Hawaii from papaya ring spot virus, a very successful product developed in the late 1980s. Uh, more recently, we have a plum pox-resistant plum came out of the ARS at USDA. Not quite on the market yet, it's coming. Plum pox is not a huge disease, 
but for the, the farmers who have to contend with it, this is a great product and they can't wait to get it. Um, a number of other products that are not yet on the market, um, the removal of allergens from common foods, right? Isn't that a useful product? I mean, we talked about golden rice this morning, but that, and, and that, again, it's a, a lightning rod, uh, but there are any number of potentially beneficial, sustainable products, water use efficient uh, products, crops, that are waiting to go into the market. Right? Let, me, so let, me you, let me interrupt you one second. I was talking to Stuart about tomatoes. Uh, when his dad was growing tomatoes in the 70s, I think they were getting 22 tons an acre. And it's up to what now? We're closer to 60 tons an acre. And you said that in some that it's 80 tons, quadrupled. Have you done that through GMOs? Uh, no, we haven't. It's just been better, it's better hybrid seed and better farming practices. What do you mean by farming practices? Like, like let's well, say water, uh, drip. Is it drip now? Drip irrigation and, and better water scheduling and monitoring and, and knowing what the, more about the life cycle of the crop. Because that's a stunning jump four times. Are you saving water on those tomatoes or are they so voracious because they're pumping out so much fruit that, that the drip, you don't really see the savings in the, in the water, let's say as a total? Well, when you're producing more, a bigger crop, you actually have to use a little more water. When you, it depends how you're measuring it on a per ton basis. We're using about 25% on a per ton basis. The amount of water that my dad, who was at the top of his game in his day, was using, um, on a per acre basis, we're, we're probably slightly a little bit above. So could we, will, Genetic engineering take us to yields at some point to help us feed the world? Will, Alan? It's already doing that. It's How? already doing that. that um, we have, well, there's no question that the farmers growing the crops now do experience higher yield, generally. Not every farmer will benefit, but generally uh, that's the case. There was a report from the National Academy of Sciences, NRC, just a couple of years ago called The Impact of Biotechnology on Farm Sustainability in the United States. Um, the general conclusion was that, yeah, we're benefiting from this. And it's not just the seed companies or the chemical companies that are making money. Farmers are benefiting, society is benefiting, the environment is benefiting, net. Now, this doesn't mean a, it, it's not a 100% ringing endorsement. There are still problems. <coughs> but the problems are not new. They're the problems that we've had to contend with in agriculture through the years. Uh, the development of herbicide-resistant weeds, for example. This is not new with genetic modification. Um, but the, we have familiarity, so we have some management techniques to, to deal with that. We haven't yet got to the point where we've introduced genes specifically for yield increases. We've seen the benefit from, of yield increase by the reduction in the pressures that keep yield uh, potential from being realized. That I is the, the reduction in the insect pressures or the, the weed pressures and so on. Um, there, there is research being done that will tweak photosynthesis so that we will see actual true yield increases in terms of the uh, efficiency of the plant to convert sunlight uh, into food. So, you know, those things are coming, but um, we do have to get over this kind of religious zeal that there's something inherently unethical or wrong with the technology. The technology is not really all that different from what we've been doing for 10,000 years. And particularly, I've yet to see somebody explain to me, uh, a person who doesn't like GMOs, why they don't like GMOs, but they're fully accepting of using ionizing radiation to scramble the, the DNA of a crop and then develop a new variety out of that. Huh? So um, technically, genetic engineering is much more precise. When you're doing crossbreeding or you're doing ionizing radiation, which is considered a traditional breeding method, you don't know what genes you've changed except for the one that you're selecting for. With genetic engineering, you know that you're adding one or two genes you can test for those. You can also test the rest of the genome just in case you've introduced something inadvertently. Uh, and those are culled in the breeding process. Right? So Let we me, still start with elite germplasm as a genetic engineering, uh, genetic engineer. You add a new trait, beneficial trait, one hopes, uh, and then test it as, through, with your agronomy people to ensure that it is what you think it is. Linda, do you share the optimism? I mean, here you are, Chancellor at UC Davis, you know, incredible institution, research, 
Do you share that optimism that maybe we can find a way to genetically engineer to increase yields and help feed the world? Well, there is, a lot of, uh, there is a lot of research that has been done in this area, and there is a lot of potential, obviously. We have seen already tremendous improvements in many ways with seeds and then uh, produce and fruits, for example. There, so a lot of it has been done and is very safe, and there is no doubt about this. However, I wanted to say that one of the major problems we have in the area of GMOs is that People do not exactly understand what it takes to create a genetically modified organism or a seed. Um, there is a lot of uh, misinformation. Such as? Um, for example, I, I, um, I quizzed a colleague of mine from a different university, a faculty member in a, a different field, not in, in uh, agriculture and in, in biology, and I said, what do you think they do when they create a genetically modified seed. And they thought that they irradiate somehow the seeds with some form of, so and they don't, of course, they don't like that because if you irradiate a cell, um, and depending on the frequency, you may deform it, create different things. And there is this fear that when you um, eat food that has been produced from genetically modified seeds, that something is going to happen to your system. So, number one, talking about education, in the early, early uh, years, all right, when in, in K to 12, for example, it's absolutely critical that we provide that information to the public. In Europe, for example, because I, I was born in Greece and I have family back in Greece, um, people are afraid of GMOs. They think that something, they are going to get cancer, for example. That is such a great, it's, it's ridiculous to have that, but there are people who are educated who think that if you eat uh, this type of food, you're going to really get sick. And so there is a lack of information, obviously, around it. But also, I have to say, we need to be transparent about what is right and what is not. So in the end Would a flounder, you know, we always heard about the flounder gene being transplanted yeah, but, but, into. I, 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 don't, me, I think that's an urban myth, the, isn't it? I, I, is it? Let me I'll, just I'll finish one thing, because okay. I, I think it's important. Um, there are two types of GMOs, and I'm not an expert, so please take what I, but my understanding is that those where you introduce very similar genes, and those are very safe, and we experiment with other GMOs where we introduce very different genes, and we don't know. So it is a, a research area, obviously, um, there, have been, there has been proof that specific GMOs are very healthy, and still there is a lot of work underway. And I think we need to be transparent, we need to educate people, we need to educate the public so the public can make the appropriate and the right decisions. Let me get Ted in here because Ted has not spoken and um, I had a real pleasure speaking to him on the phone. Okay, you're solving diseases, right? Correct. Okay. How much manipulation are you doing to solve a disease? Well, in the case of citrus, and uh, uh, by the way, how many of you had orange juice this morning? Yeah, I'm glad you had it this morning because if the uh, citrus greening or Wang Long Bing continues to spread throughout the world, uh, you'll have to uh, be drinking high uh, fructose corn syrup in the future. So, uh, but uh, we're, we're attempting to uh, a, a deal with a persistent disease, a persistent uh, a bacteria uh, that doesn't respond to the normal breeding practices. We can't cross into uh, a plant a resistance or a tolerance to this bacteria. So in order to find solutions, in this case for this particular uh, class of bacteria that we're dealing with, we have several of them actually, uh, it's going to require an understanding of the genome. And we just completed the citrus genome here a couple of years ago, and, and, and uh, you know, Alan's been very helpful in working with us on this thing and, and understanding uh, genomics and genetics and understanding the language of it and what it all means. And, and, and so the uh, Chancellor was starting to get into some of these good genes and, you know, bad uh, a, a type of transformations. But in order to solve a specifically targeted problem, uh, we have to go back to the basis of biology and understand what are functional genes. And we're just now breaking into the whole area of functional genomics. Uh, you know, we've had all of these wonderful toys that we played with over at uh, 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 Walnut Creek here in the human genome and uh, all these other uh, genetic sequencing that we've done. And we have wonderful, X, you know, A's and C's and G's and T's, 
uh, but we don't know what they mean. And now it's a case of figuring out and going through that entire cycle of what are these genes, how do they function, what do they do, and how can we move them. And in some cases, it'll be cisgenics, which is uh, moving a gene from within the citrus genome into and moving it around and finding something there. Or you have to go outside. We're, we're dealing with a spinach gene that at one point showed some pros, uh, uh, promise in the laboratory to be able to work against this particular bacteria that we're dealing with, but now it's into the field and uh, it's breaking down a little bit and maybe it's not going to work and maybe it will. But the whole challenge that we have in dealing with a applied problem of a persistent disease gets us into a whole new area of technology that we haven't ventured into before. And is genetics and genetic engineering going to help us solve the, the uh, problems in the future? Yeah. There are going to be things that we'll find that may move in faster and quicker by engineering them into the plant as opposed to just grabbing a handful of genes here and a handful of genes here and cramming them together and forcing them to work, which is what we've been doing for a thousand years, or actually specifically using our technologies to solve a basic problem. Uh, we talk about drought tolerance. Uh, there's there's <coughs> certain genes that we can grab and stick into plants and deal with drought tolerance as a problem, or climate change. All of the issues that we're facing in the future are going to have some applicability of some understanding of functional genes and being able to include those into future plants. So we're dealing with it in citrus with a specific set of diseases and barriers right now, but this technology, as we learn to understand it and the public learns to understand what's going on, then we'll be better off. I, I do want to touch on one point Go ahead. Before, I, before I get away from here, is we allowed the debate on genetics and genomics to get out of our hands. And we, it was lost from the honest brokers. And we've always considered in our lifestyle that the university and the academic community were the honest brokers of information. But we allowed this debate to be stolen from us and taken into an arena of people that don't understand a word that they're talking about half of the time. There's a few that do, but very few that, uh, uh, that, that understand what they're actually even concerned about. It's the fear-mongering that has stolen the debate and made it where we are today. And we have to get back to the honest brokers. Okay, I want to get, we're going to get to, we're going to get to how do we feed the world if we can't save our own farmland? We're going to get to some labor issues, sure. okay? Uh, we do not have a Latino on this panel, which I think is, um, I'm going to take the, the, the blame for that because I, I tried to find some of the farmers and actually contacted some of my friends who went from the fields to being farmers and couldn't get them here. But we need to get to that perspective as well. But I want to get some folks to jump in real quick on, on, and, and piggyback on some of these things. Glenda, go ahead. Yeah, I, I guess I want to try to get our conversation a little bit back towards some of the big questions we started this panel off with. Because we're here to talk about food systems. And as much as science is important, it's one tiny slice of food systems. Yeah, it's, it's important to have the science, the research, genetic or not genetic, whatever. But the UC system has so much it could offer to this debate if we could start harnessing many other aspects of the system. A perfect example, one of the most exciting things going on in California right now on regional food systems is coming out of the Sacramento area, their rural urban connection strategy, where they're harnessing computer modeling to facilitate um, local food systems, water efficiency, better markets, where to site facilities, et cetera. Uh, Rux, the SACOG Rux project. Well, that is where they've actually taken planning, typical planning tools like cities use, urban regional planning, and they flipped them on their head. So instead of having the city be all these multiple colors of different uses and the farmland be a uniform green, the city in their case is just a plain old white and the farmland is dozens and dozens of different colors that they have fed that digitization of every parcel into a computer modeling system that looks at labor and housing and transportation and water and international markets and they're helping that six county region look at food systems in a radically different way 
We need How? to be harnessing. We need to be harnessing the city regional planning. We need to be harnessing the, the business schools on how people that want to try to do local processing could finance it. That's one of the biggest problems we identified out in regional food systems. Toward what end, though? I, I'm a little confused. What, what would be the end? That we're, All these neat models, but what, what is it serving? To As farmers look at what to grow, they need to be able to look at dozens of different issues. So in the case of SACOG rucks, they can look at, okay, here's the value of alfalfa, say, versus prunes, and help that farmer run all kinds of what-if analysis on it. If they do decide prunes are better, well, you need some processing facilities. So where do you locate those? Then you look at where's the labor. Labor gets into housing. Processing gets into water, wastewater capacity. Where is that capacity? Where's the transportation links in that system so you can get the product from the field to the processor, from the processor to the local grocery store or restaurant or whatever? And then they're bringing all those pieces together in a truly comprehensive fashion. I, I can say that um, our current Secretary of Ag here in California, Karen Ross and myself, are, are desperately trying to figure out how we can get this type of system statewide and, and other states need to be looking at it as okay. well. David, you've been taking a lot of notes. Jump in with any thoughts. Go ahead. No, I, I, I guess I just wanted to comment on the previous question around GMOs. I mean, I think that was pretty widely discussed last panel, and I'm surprised at the sort of consensus that seems to be emerging in this panel. Um, and, and I guess I just want to sort of pick out a few things that people said. Um, Ted, I, I think your assertion that, that universities right now, when it comes to this issue, are, are the true honest brokers seems a little questionable to me. I mean, I'm, I'm curious how much uh, I industry dollars are, are, and folks who have biotech interests at heart are funding research at universities. And I, I'd be curious if the chancellor has figures on this. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm just saying that that, that sort of assertion. Well, it's a that good question. We look at BST, uh, the whole, you know, the hormone for more milk, that was funded by, you know, private enterprise, big companies, and then they work with the universities, and we saw what happened uh, with, with BST. Uh, so let's talk about that line that gets blurred between, you know, the profit and the university. Look, I have to jump in on this. Could I, could I say a word? Go ahead, Linda, then Alan. Um, I will just say something very brief, and then I will allow it. Um, there is, when we do science in the university, there is a very well-described ethic that we follow. Um, in, in science, you are not supported to um, then provide a point of view that is biased. Um, in, uh, when we uh, um, conduct ethical science, and even if it's supported by industry or others, what we are trying to do is to learn the truth. And then our responsibility <coughs> is to make that available. When we do basic research in a university as scientists, then we commit ourselves to that. And if we violate the, that ethical you know, framework that um, it has been provided to us, then in reality, we violate the promise we have given as faculty. So in that regard, whatever science comes out of our universities is, is the truth, the way we understand it, and that we have been able to Well, that's a nice it. ideal, but in BST, that did not happen. I mean. In which what? The, the BST. BST, the, the whole bovine it's hormone. Growth hormone. Growth hormone. Okay. I mean, the, when the research was done, they downplayed the mastitis, the, the twins that came about, all those kinds so, of things. So I don't know if that was at Rutgers. I, I know it wasn't no, UC. No, there, there are obviously, you know, um, it's a mistake to take one instance. No, there's and a lot. I, I think we could come up with more than one. one. Because in, on our campuses, we do a tremendous volume in research. And a lot of times, obviously, there will be individuals who will violate all the time. And that happens everywhere in every aspect it, of our. It might not even be a life. conscious violation, though. It's the no. partnership that is, might be troubling. Go ahead, David. I mean, I think it's the, the questions you ask determine the answers you get. So I mean, I think there's a question of, of how you're framing uh, the questions, how you approach the research inquiry. I, I think it, it's also about you know, your, the focus and, and how narrow or broad you're looking at. I mean, I think a lot of our, our model of agriculture in this state is, is necessarily moving in this direction because have set up a, a, a system where it's, a, it's almost like an arms race. Um, if you if you are setting up a, a system of, of, of monocultures, then it's gonna it, that's a system that is built on 
uh, high inputs. It's built on uh, lack of genetic diversity, and, and it, that comes with a lot of liabilities. And sure, we can fill those gaps, but, but that's what we're seeing is an arms race that leads to greater and greater reliance on technology that has uh, other uh, side effects and consequences. So when uh, we're I'll talking about, about feeding the world, the question is, is that the model of agriculture that will work in other places? Alan, you're wincing a yeah, little bit. This, Go ahead. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I have to deal with this fairly frequently because I'm an educator dealing in a controversial technology, genetic modification. Um, there's an implication that anybody who takes private money is somehow suspect that, uh, not necessarily corrupt outright, but influenced by the source of their funds. Now. Consider the alternative. I mean, our academic researchers, we get research funds to do our, our research. Um, I mean, the chancellor outlined the principle of ethical performance. And I know that the practice is as she says. I don't know anybody who uh, modifies their data. I mean, that would be despicable. Uh, or even tries to, um, to gain favor with their, their private funding source through their, their research. So, I mean, that's just a, an observation on that point. But consider the alternative. If we academic scientists didn't get funding from private sources, then we have to get it from public sources. And how many of you are happy to raise your taxes so that I can do my research? Okay. Right? Now, let me, before, I'm just one last Go ahead, line. go ahead. I do not take industry funding. I do not take industry funding simply to um, address the people who seem to think that I am corrupt because some of my colleagues do. <laughs> and I know that my colleagues are not. Yeah, Mark, uh, I don't okay. want to. Wait, wait one second, Joe. I'm, oh, sure. the, um, I want to get back to the feeding the world, okay? Okay. <laughs> it's, it's a little tough because we're having a heck of a time feeding <laughs> California, but can we? Obviously, the way we make our crop decisions and what we're growing, and while a lot of it is more of it's going toward the world market than it may be even domestically, a lot, of, a lot more now, we're, um, we still can't feed the world, okay? Uh, maybe we could do a little bit what was suggested at lunch. But what if we exported a model to the rest of the world that might work? And Paul, talk about your model. Do you think, I mean, you know, it's sustainable, organic, and it taps into all this lovely kind of stuff, and it's precious, but it, is it real? And could it, could it be taken to somewhere else and be successful and employ, as, I mean, I'm, you're almost employing a person per acre, right? Yeah, we're, we're pretty close to that. It's, yeah, um, so talk you know, about I, that. I mean, there are a lot of contradictions in this, in this conversation. Um, there is con contradiction that, that, that uh, we expect that um, we under, uh, in the genetics, ge genetics uh, uh, argument is, is that we, we're, we're allocating uh, precious research dollars in a, in a line of thought that I think everyone feels like is going to pay back big. But in fact, I think we're, we're missing the fundamentals. You know, how does the system work? Who, how are people rewarded in the system? How are, uh, how's farm labor seen? Is it seen as an input that's expendable? Or is it seen as an asset? That is, is, is that anyone who eats is responsible for the well-being of that asset. Um, and I think we, we, we kind of get off track a little bit in, in understanding the, the, the functional, the kind of basics of these systems. You know, to be a farmer, you have to understand how plants grow and things work in a fundamental level. Um, and, you know, to argue whether, whether you should be um, objecting to ionizing radiation or transgenes or whether those are good or bad, those, that ends up being way beyond the, the scope of most farmers. For, for farmers in the third world, to think about how you, how you come about indigenous solutions, how you, how you harvest more nitrogen from the air, how you sequester more carbon. If we have, a, if we have an issue with um, global warming, it uh, seems to me a job of farmers is going to have to be, how do you, you organize your farm so that you're actually sequestering more carbon and, and you're, you're mitigating some of the impacts of this agricultural system? How long did it take I, to build up your soil? And, and what, what is it like right now, the microbial life in your soil? You know, I, we've been doing this for 30 years, um, and I think we have measurable increases in, in our organic matter in our soil. Um, I think we can see responses in, in, in a, across the board in terms of our tilth, in terms of the, the friability of our soil and, and, and the crop responses that we have. Um, we grow cover crops religiously. 
um, we incorporate that material into the ground or we're looking more and more to non-incorporation? Can we do organic no-till? Um, I think those, those notions of how you use less energy to produce more crop, but also how you harvest the most potential energy and sunlight that's falling on your system is a critical, critical element of how agriculture is going to move forward. It's a fundamental question. If we're, if we're looking at a, at a larger pattern of what our farm actually produces, okay, if we're not just being rewarded for crops or looking at crops uh, and yield per acre, and I think our yields per acres are right up there, but we're looking at the, the, the soil health that we're, we're harvesting, if we're looking at the insect ecology that we can manage that can do biological services for us, if we're looking at our water cycle and how our, our management practices will allow more of that um, uh, green water to penetrate, not run off, be utilized by crops. Those are fundamental practices that I think that we can get way out here. So could you on the see notion that some technology is going to be going to save the day when in fact those simple technologies are the ones that any farmer can use in any system that will ultimately improve their productivity. Could, there be, could there be 5,000 full belly farms in California? Well, certainly there could be. Okay, I how mean, about in the could, world? Can there be? Uh, there could, uh, yeah, I, I actually feel like that, you know, we, we shouldn't fool ourselves because it's going to be uh, a system uh, kind of alluded to by Wes Jackson where we're not trying to fool nature. We're not assuming that we understand something as complex as the genome. When, when was it just uh, uh, six or eight months ago when a Stanford study came out and said that everything we thought was junk? Yeah, in code. Wasn't junk. It's a system of wiring. It's all the processes of subtle inputs that are, in fact, informing other genes at all times in this dynamic system of dynamic relationships. And we think we can throw a gene in there and actually know what we're doing. Stuart? I think there's a tremendous amount of hubris and a tremendous amount of promise that, in fact, needs to be uh, moderated with a little respect for, the, in fact, the complexity of the, of the organisms we're dealing with. And also, Stuart, wait, Stuart, given, Stuart. also a recognition that the food system is just the tip of the iceberg when we start moving towards a bio-based economy, which is where ultimately the planet's going to have to really go if, if we want to solve a lot of problems, not just food. Scale, what do, what do they mean? Is Can you see 5,000 full bellies, or do we see bigger farmers farming bigger, you know, more yeah. land, and is that the exportable model to the world? Well, I guess, I guess when you think about an exportable model to the world, I guess if you go country by country and figure out what do they need, you know, if it's an economic development issue, I think you probably need more sustainable, smaller farms to build an economy, to build distribution, to, you know, build from there. Uh, if you're looking at California, that's already developed. Uh, that's already, you know, there. Uh, and you're looking for growers to supply large branded food companies globally. You know, somebody like Frito-Lay probably wants to buy 10, 20 million pounds at a pop of almonds and not go around and buy from a bunch of full bellies, right? So my point is, I think we all serve different markets. Um, I think there's an opportunity for all of us to do well. My personal belief, um, you know, if, if it's about economic development, we gotta figure out how to help these smaller farmers get going. If it's about food supply and security, then I think probably utilizing some of the best technology and working with some of the larger scale growers that can really drive the economics, drive food safety, and, and do that in a larger massive way. I mean, I, my point is, in all of this, uh, you know, David, you should never buy product from me uh, under your, your organization because huh. what, what I, I hear what you're saying is you want somebody that's smaller, local, you want to support. No, but you were on the list, he said. Yeah, I know he said that, but yeah. I think it's about hooking up the right supplier to the right buyer. And I'm not necessarily your right supplier. Mm -hmm. I'm Frito's right supplier, okay? And I think we do a great job and we, we do a lot of terrific things and have a great workforce, take care of them. But uh, there are all these different models. And I think they're all great models. When I was listening, I thought, geez, how could those got, that earlier panel have gone three hours? We do need another hour to address two huge issues. One is labor. And you just said it. it, it do, does, do valleys 
end up being premised on an underclass and f farm labor and the poverty that, is, is, that accompanies it. Is there a model out there that is different? And then climate change. I mean, Larry was talking about is, if climate change and what's going to happen to the Sierra, which is a tremendous resource for us. It's what we, it is our resource. And when, that, when, when the shoulders start becoming more rock than snow, what, what's that going to mean? We didn't get to address that. But we did touch on a lot. I'm not sure we solved much, but I think <laughs> we've defined. I mean, it's like, you know, try to love the questions themselves. Okay. <laughs> and I think this we know. So I, I, I'd like to do just a little bit of wrap up, if you'll bear with me, because I think that uh, we have a few thank yous to do, not only to this panel, which I'll get to, but also the morning panel. And the things that I've heard during the day and that all of you are going to get to address over the next couple days is one, framing the discussion, how you frame the discussion, and what you include in that is really important. Also, that justice includes inclusion, that is having a whole number of different kinds of points of view and people at the table, and it also includes listening. So a lot of listening needs to happen. It seems to me that everybody's made the point of political will. There has to be political will to get movement in this area, no matter what, from local community levels on up to global country levels. Uh, it also seems like we've heard that we need short, mid, and long-term solutions, and that all kinds and ways of doing agriculture are part of the solution to the global hunger problem. It also seems that several people have said we really do need to think about designing with nature, which I think most farmers do if they're successful, to many degrees they're designing with nature, not compete and not conquer. I heard that several times today. And this don't be tied to an ideal ideology, which relates back to being inclusive and looking at all kinds of ways of solving the hunger problem. So I'd like to thank our global audience, 500 different sites logged on. I'd like to thank all of you. I'd like to thank our panelists, both this afternoon and this morning, and our two moderators, both Michael Spector and Mark Era. And I'd also like to thank Pete King and Pete's team that helped put this together, and Rose Hayden Smith and Vanessa Mura, who did a lot of the work with you panelists and helping you get together. And you know what? I'm going to have to be really fast and generic, but a whole lot of people helped put this day together for us today. In addition, we have Bob Sam's team with the communication services. We have the UC Davis team that's running all of these projectors and video conferencing. Uh, uh, we have Sherry Cooper's group in the program support unit that has made all of this flow and uh, so we have a big team together, and this is a start, and we're going to continue over the next two days, and we're going to, I'll introduce you then to Morgan Doran and Edie Allen, who put the overall concept of this whole three days that we have together. So tomorrow morning, we'll uh, start with that. And meanwhile, this evening, then, we have an, a tremendous opportunity to have a roving dinner and poster session throughout the hotel. So it starts at 5.30 and you can eat fine food from California, drink and look at the science and extension and education 
uh, activities that we have uh, been conducting in the University of California in the Division of Ag and Natural Resources. So thank you so much for being here today. Thank you.